Hello, Miss Anastasia. Um, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'm doing fine. So um, I'll be a moderator today along with um, Yifeng, um, uh, Haley, and um, Makai. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to ask you something. Um, are you doing a kind of presentation um, thing or is it um, a Q&A kind of presentation? So I do have a deck. Um, that we can run through. If that's helpful for you all, it's going to give you a little bit of context on some things. Or we can do a Q&A style. What do you think is more beneficial to your classmates? Um, we just do, uh, we have our guest speaker present. Mm -hmm. There's slideshows, and now we have like a Q&A. That's perfect. That's perfect. All right, so y'all let me know when y'all are ready for me to get started. And then... I can get everything pulled up. So yeah, y'all just let me know when you're ready, okay? Yeah, uh, okay. we're ready when you are. Okay. Ready to go. All right, can y'all see my screen? Yeah, all good. We can see it. Perfect. All right. So I am Anastasia Simon. I'm a senior associate at Shadow Ventures, and we're going to be talking today about green building technology. Um, all right. So Shadow Ventures, we are a seed stage venture capital firm. Our main offices are in Atlanta, Georgia, but we do have an office in New York, and we have one in Denver, Colorado right now. Um, our focus is investing in startups that bring innovation to the built environment, and our scope includes construction tech, prop tech, smart building tech, modular, offsite, sustainability. Basically, if it's technology that's going to go into any part of the building life cycle from site selection all the way through to end of life, it's the kind of technology that we're looking at. We are pure play technology uh, kind of company. So that means no like companies that are the Uber of. That's not really our jam. No marketplaces. It really is that deep technology that's going to disrupt the environment that we're looking for. So like I said, I'm a senior associate. My background, oddly enough, is not in finance, nor is it in engineering or construction. I actually come from the apparel industry. Um, I spent the better part of a decade working in marketing roles with high growth tech startups, working with apparel companies, and moved into working at Shadow from the lens of building out our ecosystem. Our, um, accelerator program and in our incubator program. We had about 65 startups in that program. And now my uh, focus is green building technology. While I'm running an accelerator, we are going to be launching next month um, with five startups that are going to all be focused on green building tech. So I've become the person who's the resident expert for sustainability, um, even though my background is apparel, which I had, there are a lot of parallels. You'd be surprised. We can talk about that a little later if you'd like. All right, so as a quick overview, um, the built environment is about $40 trillion in assets. So the way that that's kind of listed, it's not just buildings themselves. They also talk about infrastructure and those kinds of things within that. But when you just think about real estate, it's still one of the largest asset classes in the U.S., comprised of both commercial and residential. Um, in the past year, You've seen over 210 billion in losses due to extreme weather um, predicated by climate change. The built world contributes 40% of global carbon emissions, 30% of global energy use, and 40% of raw materials. We are one of the big polluters when it comes to, um, to climate change. We're huge contributors. And then right now there are tons of net zero emissions goals that have been put out, including some that have been put in place in the state of New York with the goal of getting there by 2050, which seems like a long way off, but it really isn't. All right, so what's green building technology? Um, the best way to think about it is it's those technologies that are gonna make it, make the industry more energy efficient, going to make the industry more um, reduce waste. It's going to reduce time. It's all of those kind of things. It's it's very 
it's very broad and all encompassing, to be honest. We're thinking things like data driven solutions and building building intelligence platforms. So those platforms that are looking at your energy usage and consumption and trying to optimize that and say, do we turn off lights here? Um, It's HVAC systems and doing modern HVAC so it can reduce kind of the operational carbon, what we call the carbon emissions that are emitted during the use of the building. So it's a very broad kind of category the way that we look at it. And then why now? So as I just mentioned, We got an environmental crisis going on. Like, that's not a surprise to anybody. There's policy changes um, going on from the federal level with a lot of the initiatives of the Biden administration. There's local laws. Like I said, New York has their Climate Mobilization Act that's going on. Uh, It's local laws 97 and 92. It's about six different local laws that are specifically applied to the built environment. And it, it talks about things from reducing emissions to green roofs to waste and it's just very all encompassing. Another reason why now you have the built environment's role, again, like I said, we're a huge polluter. Um, And then there's also for us on an investment side, we're always looking about where, where the opportunity is for return. And you're seeing a lot more companies investing in green building. And then there's the change in the consumer base. Um, As you see with millennials, as we're getting older, You know, the things that we kind of focus on are a lot more transparency in the space. You see the same thing with Gen Z. People care more about environmental social governance goals than I think previous generations did because there's a level of transparency that exists now that didn't exist prior to the Internet. Um, And that's kind of also changing the behavior patterns within organizations. Um, And then technology is cheap. Like at the end of the day, everything that's driving tech innovation within every industry is that right now the cell phone that I have is more powerful than the computer I had when I was your age sitting in school. And so this again kind of runs the quick numbers of the window of opportunity. You know, we don't really need to get into it unless you guys want to dig into venture capital, which is a different, much different conversation. (laughs) All right. So some of the trends that I'm seeing in green building tech, you have that race to zero. So when we talk about net zero, um, if you hey, this is Toby, and if yeah. you don't mind, because I, we have students that are really smart and love to learn. If you could just maybe explain like a, the short version of what venture capital is and how venture Perfect. capital works, because we Thank like you. to bring smart people to the table and have them learn something new. And this is a very fresh area that we haven't yet touched on. Okay, thank you. You also throw in there a little bit. I know you mentioned in the beginning, but a little anecdote of how you got into it. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Toby. And that's great. Um, So, yeah, because I didn't really know if you guys had dug into this. So, venture capital, let's kind of roll back. So, the best way that I explain venture capital to people is if I go out and I get money from 10 people, 10 rich people, I get their money. I put a little bit of my money in it, and then I start investing in companies. Um, And say I invest in 10 startups. We got $10 million. We put a million dollars into 10 startups. Out of those 10 startups, about seven of them will just, will fail. It just is what it is. It's nothing they did. There's a ton of reasons why they might fail. They'll have great, they'll have great intentions, but most businesses, most startups, most small businesses fail straight out the gate. Um, out of the three remaining, two of them are going to give me back my million dollars that I gave them. One of them is going to return probably 10, 100 X. They're going to return over the amount of money that I spent. So you're, you're banking on that one company. So if I gave out 10 million, let's say that one company returns 50 million. So I can give everybody else their money, plus their return and keep my percentage. That's like a high level way to kind of explain it. It's just when people, even when my parents ask me, what do you do? I invest other people's money. Um, and that's, that's like kind of, that's a very, like I said, high level kind of um, a breakdown on it. How I got into venture capital. So our founder, KP Ready, has been working in the built environment for about 20 years. Um, He and I started working together at a company that did robotic sewing. 
So I was hired because of my expertise in the apparel industry. So I came in and my goal was to translate between our engineers and, you know, the computer science teams that were developing the solution and the apparel industry people who knew nothing about computer science language. The computer science people knew nothing about apparel language. So I was the one in the middle kind of sorting this out and helping them to develop a better solution, but also helping to sell within the industry. So I did that for about two years working under KP as our, as the CEO of that company, he exited and I moved to another company, which was an entertainment technology company. So it was music tech. Um, I worked there as the director of marketing and communications for about a year while I was there. KP kind of called me out of the blue and was like, Hey, do you want to come and work with me? I'm building this new venture. My goal going there was to continue to learn from someone who knew the industry, who knew technology, who knew investing so that I could one day move into doing my own kind of my own firm, honestly. Um, And so I kind of moved over with him. And my goal again was to build out our incubator. So an incubator is where you get early stage tech companies to kind of come in and you're going to, like the name suggests, incubate them. So you're going to work with them, help them to develop their business plans so that they can grow as a company and so that they can get to a point where they are investable. Um, our incubator, like I said, we've had about 65 companies come through the program. We've invested to date in about five of them um, <clears throat> with plan more investments over the next um, 12 months. Excuse me. Those companies um, are all prop tech or construction tech. Again, some various form of the building life cycle. They're touching on with technology. It could be like we have one company that does, um, they do water monitoring within leak detection within your apartment. So say your dishwasher breaks or your fridge is running. Um, instead of having it something break and flood your apartment and flood the, build, the apartments below you, it immediately notices, hey, there's a leak and turns off the water. And so that's the kind of technology that we're looking at, things that are employing um, IoT, so Internet of Things, things that are using um, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, solutions like that, that are really making it easier for architects and designers to build, to design, making it easier for contractors to actually build and then for managers to actually manage and operate their buildings. That's great. Thank you. No problem. No problem. And thank you. And if you guys have any questions as I'm going, I'll just pause and you guys feel free to kind of ask me. Um, I can't see the, the chat. Yeah, because if you guys are putting questions in the chat for some reason. Uh, right yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, the question is, is this why corporations... Yeah, just speak, speak up a little bit. Speak up. Uh, you speak, speak up so we go over yeah. All right. Uh, the question is, is this why corporations that support environmentally friendly products skyrocket? Um, so you're saying why they're successful. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. That's my question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are a couple reasons why companies that are focused on environmental goals are successful. One is it depends on the market that they're in. Um, For us, like I said, it's the built environment. So we sell, the companies we work with are selling to other companies. So that's a bit different. Companies that are selling to consumers, right now, one of the things you have is that behavioral shift where a lot more people care about stuff being environmentally responsible and socially responsible. And so consumers look at that and they're like, I want to be a better person. I want to be a better consumer. So I'm going to buy the brand that I know is more sustainable over the one that isn't. And so that's what it is. When I spoke to that level of transparency that you're seeing, that's kind of why you're seeing those things. First of all, like kind of taking off in the market, everything's sustainable, everything is green. Um, But that's, that's really what it is. And then you also have to know that a lot of companies that tell you that they're doing something green or sustainable, they are doing what we call greenwashing where it's just marketing. It's like any other form of marketing. They make one or two tweaks and all of a sudden the company's sustainable. And it really, if you dig into it, it's not. 
you know, and that's across any product class, even particularly in the built environment, we see it a lot. Okay, so Megan says she'll speak. Oh. Um, Haley and I had the same question, actually. Um, which green ETF should one invest? So I do not give investment advice. <laughs> um, and that's just, I mean, it would be hard for us to find anybody who's going to give you investment advice on the internet. Um, typically for us, because the way Ben's were set up, we're actually investing in companies. So, and when I personally invest on my own, I'm always investing stock in companies. I'm not a big like fan of ETFs for a couple different reasons. But what I'm going to say is that like, yeah, so somebody's saying Blink Charge, Blink is a good company. As far as companies that I invest in, uh, Plug Power is one. Um, there are a couple different ones on the energy side that I'm investing in. But again, don't take investment advice from people on the internet. That's the biggest piece of investment advice I want to give y'all. You know, go out, research it. You guys are kids, y'all are smart. Research it. You know, don't get, don't listen to, to Rich Talk all the time. All right. Any other questions you got? Um, Haley Busuela um, had a question. Um, if you can unmute, that'll be, that'll be good. Um, it was similar to Megan's. It was about green energy um, ETFs, like which would be good to invest in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, because Megan said that when she came on, uh, Dimitri. So, yeah. Any other questions while we're paused right now, guys? Um, I have a question. What's up? Um, what is it like working in this field? Mm, that's a good question. I like that. So, it is very dynamic with shifting priorities. So, if you're someone who wants to go into venture capital, um, you've got to be great at math um, because I do like right now, one of the things that's on my desk is diligencing a company where what I'm really doing is sitting down and I'm looking at their financials. I'm understanding if the things that they're telling me about their path to success, if those things are true um, and trying to make sense of kind of their projections, you know? And so you do have to be really good at math. You have to be really good at shifting through what is true and what is false, doing a ton of good research. Um, you don't have to be a subject matter expert, whether it is the built environment or if we're talking about consumer brands, but it helps for you to actually know the market and understand what you're looking at. So you can kind of apply your experience to that. Um, my domain area of expertise is actually marketing and doing market research and analysis. And so that actually really helps a lot with, particularly with the companies we work with who are developing solutions that are more marketing kind of solutions. Um, but it also helps with me having to understand the market size that they're projecting. So them saying, Hey, it's going to be, a $900 billion market. And I have to go out and make sure that that's actually true. And so that's one of the things that I'm actually, I really like doing. And you get to learn a lot about new technology that's in the pipeline, new technology that can kind of change the way that we live. Cause we all live in buildings. We all interact in buildings. And so the technology that we see is technology for solutions that you probably never would have even thought somebody needed to develop a solution for, you know? And so that's really like, for me, that's the most important thing. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So I see a couple more in the, um, in the chat. So do you have to worry about politics, making laws about the environment with dealing with these companies? So yes and no. Um, Essentially, you don't want to be as a business owner building your business around public policy. Um, as we have seen with the current change in administration, it is the stroke of a pen and the raise of a hand that changes things, you know, and you don't want to be at the mercy of that. Um, you want to make sure that when you develop your business model, you're looking at what's coming out of the private sector. So what other businesses are doing, what consumers are doing and basing your model on that. 
So you don't want to, you don't want to do that. That's just as a rule, that's kind of bad business. Uh, thankfully right now the tide has changed as it relates to um, climate change. And so you are seeing more regulations that are just going to make it easier for consumers, for customers to adopt the technology that's coming out, you know, but yeah, you don't generally speaking, you don't want to do that. What made you pick this job as your career? So let me be honest with you kids. <laughs> I did not pick this as my career. The career that I had, the path I had planned out when I was in high school, I wanted to be a buyer. Um, if no one knows what a buyer is, it is a person who buys products for retail stores. That was my thing. I wanted to do that. Um, went to college, studied uh, apparel merchandising, really loved that worked in wholesale sales. I used to come up to New York probably about five to 10 times a year for different markets where I was selling um, apparel and things like that. The showroom I worked at in Atlanta closed because um, things happen. And I moved from that world into technology through working at software automation um, because they needed someone who understood the apparel value chain um, to come and work there. And that's really kind of how that happened. And I just kind of have followed that path. And what for me has always been my North star, it's not about the job I want. It's about the person that I want to be and the kind of person that I want to be and the kind of impact I want to, I want to leave on people. So for me, it's always been about how can I create a more equitable and sustainable future? Um, and what I have learned through the investing in tech ecosystem is that if me as an investor, I have the ability to make a huge impact on the world. One, as a woman, most venture capitalists are not women. Most venture capitalists are not black women. Um, I have the ability to change the narrative and to change who's getting a check and to, to make lasting change on the world. And that's really what I look at it for. But yeah, like when you're building a career, yes, have a goal of I want to do this job, but also be flexible because life comes at you quick, you know, and you have to be able to adapt. Okay. So we got a lot. Okay. We got a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, so, I'm looking at it. Dimitri, if you can kind of help me wade through it because I start talking. I apologize. I apologize. And, and questions. All right. So, um, David, David had a question. Um, he asked, what, what are important factors of marketing? So in marketing, you have what you call the four P's. Most people think of marketing as just the promotional element. Um, in marketing, you have, so it is your product. What is the product? You know, it is the place within the market that the product sits in. It is your pricing strategy. So like, how much is this product going to cost? Um, and then it's the promotion. So those are the four things that is like marketing 101 in college, your first marketing class, you're going to talk about those four things. And so it's understanding how your product fits with your customer, how your product is connected to your customer. Is the price point correct? Am I a luxury product that's super expensive or am I something that's more affordable? A lot of those are the things that you're really doing when you're looking at at marketing. It's not just like, let's do some Instagram ads, you know, which people, I'm pretty sure my parents think that's what I did for a large part of, part of my career, just like making, writing copy, which you do, but that's not really what it is. It's really the fundamentals of the business. Does that help me? David. Okay. Um, also, Haley Polino had a question. Um, if you can unmute. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, what would convince someone to switch to your company? Okay. So if somebody wanted to come and work for our company, what do I think? I think it's because it's a great, we have a really good learning environment. Um, most of the people that come and work for us, yes, we have great benefits and things like that, but it's because they really want to learn. Um, most venture capitalists, if you go on to like Andreessen Horowitz, which is a huge um, venture firm, or you go into Fifth Wall, which is a big firm in prop tech, you're going to see a lot of Harvard MBAs, 
on their role when you see the people that work there. Our firm is not like that. Um, everybody at our firm is someone who has either worked at you know tech companies and been like employee number five, or there's someone who has had their own company. And so we have a very different, we're very gritty, we're scrappy, we run our company like a startup. And so it's a huge learning opportunity. Like, to be honest, I would never be working in venture capital with my background um, if I were going out for a traditional firm. I'd have to go out and get my MBA. Uh, but we don't really, our firm isn't set up like that. And I think that's really the, the most attractive thing, that if you want to learn VC, we bring you in and we're like, no, you don't have to have an MBA, but you have to understand how to do that and you have to sit down and want to learn and do the work. And that's really kind of how we look at it. So, yeah, so if you want to do the work, you want to learn it, you know, you're scrappy, it's a good company for you. Um, also, um, Martina had a question. Mm -hmm. um, if you can mute, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I'll read it for her. Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, she asks, do you think that our generation will have a big change into climate tech since we are more involved? I hope your generation is doing a huge change into climate tech. That's what I want to see. I hope that my generation is laying the groundwork so that your generation can come in and just fill it. You know, this next decade for so the 20s, the 2020s, this is such a pivotal decade for climate change that... You know, I'm really excited. And I'm excited when you guys get out of, by the time you're out of college, the engineering projects, construction projects you would be working on, all will have a green thing to them. So yeah, so I'm, I'm excited. And I think it's going to be a huge, a huge opportunity for you all to kind of understand more about environmental management and things like that. So yeah, you know, I'm, I'm excited. Honestly, I'm super excited. Myra also had a question. Hi, um, you kind of already answered it. I asked, um, where do you see technology going in the next decade or so? But um, um, I'm currently a senior at Wasad, and what would what would what would you say to someone going to college without like um um some sort of plan in the next five years or so? So when you say going to college without a plan, like no idea what you want to do, just signing up. No, like um, I mean, like no um. Um, no, like, dream career, kind of? Okay, okay. So, the first thing I would say is to really kind of, first of all, take stock in what you're passionate about. Um, a college degree gets you in the door. So think about what you're, pa you're passionate about. Think about what it is that you love doing and that you would do for free, but you want to get paid for. Uh, so that's really kind of how I would look at it. Of course, things to maybe major in or keep an eye out. If you like coding, go into that. I always, I don't push people into coding because it's very, you have to have a certain mindset for that. And if you want to do it, I'm all about it. If it's not you, that's fine. Um, so I would kind of look into more of your STEM careers. If you're into environment and into, into that space, environmental management is a good one to kind of look into. Um, also environmental engineering is really interesting. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, to be realistic, when you go into college, you can go in and say, oh, this is what the market is doing now. So I'm going to base my path solely on what the market is doing now. When I went into college, I started in 2002. By the time I graduated, the market, the housing market had dropped. And so if I based my path on the market, which I did, like what most people do, um, there were no jobs when I got out. So what I would say to you is base it on what you are passionate about. Base it on what you're interested in learning, you know, and you'll, it'll like, you'll figure it out. Trust me. You figure it out a lot more often. You figure it out when you're doing it, you know? Haley, we still haven't had another question. So I think Haley put her question in the chat is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I said that with, so with everything going on with Biden and like climate change and bring us back into like the rest of so like I heard a lot about watching stocks grow and so I'm getting into stocks and everything so like how do I know what good like energy and environmentally based companies would be like good to invest in so things you want to look at when you're looking at investing in a company you want to understand like their ability to come into a market and gain what you call like their share of the market that's something you want to look at um 
Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm learning about stocks as we go too, because like I said, the kind of investing we do is not the stock market. But what we do is we invest in company. We don't invest like it's not. It's not like that. Um, but yeah, so you want to kind of look and see like. You want to learn about the CEO and understand who's running the company. You want to understand like their ability to come in and become profitable. Those are things that you're looking at. You also always want to buy low. You know, um, if you're looking for energy and environment based companies, I can get you some research and share it with your teachers and have them kind of share it with you. I can give you guys kind of a list on just energy specific. My forte is energy in the built environment. So it's not going to be a lot of solar or anything like that. So I'll give you guys a list. Um, probably get that to you guys on Friday. Hey, Trish, you good? Yeah, thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, said, any more questions? Yeah. I see somebody said renewable energy, like for sure. And see, that's another thing. When you say renewable energy, that's broad. So I'll get you guys some stuff because that's like solar. That can be hydro. Like there's a couple different things that are that fall under renewable, um, for sure. All right. Um, Justin Hunter had a very good question. Um, if you can mute and um, ask a question, or well, I'll I'll read it. Mm -hmm. I'll just read it. Um, what are some complications you have experienced when attempting to market? to a certain um, demographic? Mm. Let me think. So it kind of, it, it depends on what it is. I mean, a lot of times when we're talking, so my expertise is digital marketing. Um, so a lot of that, you'd be surprised. It like, <laughs> there's certain stuff you'll do and you'll do what you'll have all the strategy laid correctly. And you're like, yes, this should net this outcome. And it doesn't. And you don't understand why you don't understand like where, where your strategy went, went wrong. And it could be something that's completely outside influence that you never would have thought about. That's like somebody put up a billboard in some area that was showing something you have no idea. So it's, Usually the disconnect you see when you're trying to bring a product to market, it's like um, right now everybody's talking about Rihanna with her fancy line and how they're not doing clothing anymore. And that really is a huge disconnect because Rihanna's customer is not somebody who can buy like a thousand dollar shirt or her girls don't buy that. And so that's the biggest disconnect you see is people who don't undertake the time to learn their customer to understand what their customer Maybe what the customer may operate in and behave accordingly. That's usually the biggest like disconnect that I see is between the company itself and the customer they're going after. Hi, I was the one who asked the question initially. I just yeah. wanted to say thank you. Oh, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> Um, I also had a question myself. Okay. Um, I remember you speaking a little about um, like eventually creating your own firm. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak about that a little bit more? Yeah. So that's probably a ways off. Um, me doing my own firm focused on sustainable investing just because, you know, there's a lot of capital that is, it's very capital intensive. So it requires a lot of money to get into the venture capital game um, until you have the money it, it, it can take a while. It's based on you. So if you are a general partner at a venture firm, typically you have to put up a certain percentage of the money that you're going to raise. To do that, you have to be what is called an accredited investor. Now, this is something I always tell this to people and they're like, I didn't know this was a thing. So the average person cannot invest in a startup um, or what you would call... They're like um, non-traditional asset classes. So you or I could invest in like real estate, but or we could buy art if we wanted to, but we couldn't buy, invest in particularly early stage startups because they're inherently risky. So what the SEC, uh, Security Exchange Commission, what they've kind of come up with is these rules on you have to have these things if you want to invest in this type of asset. 
those rules are you have to make 200000 a year um, for the past two years and have the reasonable assumption that you're going to make it for the next few years. You, If you're married, it's, you have to make 300 as a couple. Um, or you have to have a million dollars in network that does not include your residence. Okay. There are also a couple other stipulations around certain regulations, certain um, certificates you have to hold from working in the investment world to prove that like if you have your series seven or 65, that you actually understand the risks that are inherent in this. Um, also, because I work at a venture capital firm and I've been doing diligence on companies, it is reasonable to assume that I am an employee who has, um, I forgot the legal term for it, but basically it's reasonable to assume that I know what I'm doing. You know, the way that the SEC has set those rules up, it keeps a ton of people from being able to invest in early stage companies because most Americans do not make $200,000. You know, they, most Americans do not have a million dollars in net worth. And so because of that, you know, it's kind of created all these barriers that prevent people from, from gaining access to ways that they can build wealth. Um, and the financial pieces are really not there because people think rich people know better. They're there because if I have $5 million in net worth and I give you 50000 and you run off with my money, I'm okay. But if I make a hundred thousand a year and I only have maybe ten thousand in net worth and I give you fifty thousand dollars, that's half of what I earn in a year. And you run off with my money, I'm sitting out here stuck and don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills. You know? And so that's really kind of why those laws are set in place. So if you want to go into venture capital, nine times out of ten, you need to yourself be accredited already. You know. Because I'm going to have to write the first check into my fund and it needs to be like a two, three million dollar check. And I can't do that if I don't meet the requirements. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's also some other questions yeah. in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, we got some. Yeah. So, the okay. first two questions is asked by Maya. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if uh, she can unmute. If not, I can read it for her. Yeah, I can uh, read it. Uh, uh, I can read it. Yeah, I'll just read it for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, mm -hmm. What sparked your interest in prop tech landscape? So I think the real thing for prop tech is, again, all of us live in or work in buildings. You know, and once I started to see what kind of technology was coming out of that. So when you talk about prop tech, like Nest, like the Nest um, thermostats within your home, that's prop tech. You know, I don't think people think about that, but that's prop tech. Um, and so for me, I don't, I know I hadn't thought about it until I started getting into the industry. The amazing solutions that you see that really, like I said, they're trying to make your life easier. Some of them. Um, like there's one company we actually are, we just did an investment deal with. And what they do is when you pay your rent every month, they give you a percentage cash back into a savings account. And they're going to allow you to take that money and maybe put it in your Robin Hood account to invest in stock, or you can convert it to Bitcoin, or you can just put it in the bank and spend it on what you want. And so I thought like, that's a very cool kind of solution that's going to help a lot of people get a little cash back from paying rent, which is too high. Um, or, you know, but their solution is the problem they're solving is really for, you know, the property managers who are trying to bring in the right kinds of people to their property. So it's a marketing play. They're trying to attract the right tenants. And so they, seeing things like that and seeing how they're, they're solving it, that's what really got me super interested in prop tech. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for your answer. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, another question is, uh, what concepts do you consider when thinking of future ideas? Uh, so for personal ideas, I'm just kind of letting my brain walk, run wild. But when we're talking about, you know, companies that are coming into 
into our program, what things that we're kind of, are we looking for and we're considering for technology? So the one thing, like I said earlier, is, is it a peer play technology company? Is it real technology that solves a real problem in this space? Um, so I think that's kind of like the big thing that we're looking at. Then the other thing is, is it defensible? So is it technology that, you know, anybody can go out and build who has the internet? Or is it technology that takes time and effort and is protected by um, patents and things like that? So those are kind of things that we're looking for. But it really always comes down to, are they solving a real problem? Yeah. Uh, Haley Paulino also asked the question about as a woman working in the marketing field, do you get treated equally? So marketing as a whole, regardless of the industry, is heavily dominated with women. Um, and that's just like marketing. For me, coming from marketing, moving deeper into venture as a senior associate, um, I would like to say that I get treated equally, but that is not true. Uh, there are still a lot of hurdles that you have to climb that I see that my male counterparts don't. Um, I also am in the unique position of being a black woman. So that is, that intersection is very different than if I were a white woman or if I were Latina or if I were Asian. Um, we all have our different experiences within this industry but are we treat or is it are we being treated equitably um and fairly all the time no um what can we do about it it's not much on us to do anything because you know you don't i don't have the problem as the woman i tell people all the time if you're in a situation you just got to do your best that's it all you can do is your best. Um, it is not your problem if someone is sexist or someone is racist or someone is homophobic or transphobic. That is not your problem. That is theirs. And don't you make it your problem. Do not take that on. Um, just know you have to show up every day doing your best. And that's all you can do. And hopefully by the time you guys are out of school, we can have gotten some sense into some people. That was a really great answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next, you have. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi. So, um, my question was, what do you think a solution could be for Florida and their rising water situation? So, I, I the part I want to talk about is that you can speak for yours. So, what's your? It sounds like you have a thought on the solution, and I want to hear your solution. Uh, I really just meant for the question, but um, oh. for my thought, I always had the idea of uh, like elevating the buildings. Okay. I don't know how possible that would be, being that a lot of them are built already, but I know that the issue is very uh, current and it's hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. you know? So I really want to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, so um I think it's the Netherlands or something like that, that they have a very complex like dam system. They actually kind of keep the seawater out. I don't know that that would work for all of Florida because the problem is really like South Florida where you're seeing a lot of that happening. Um, there are, they are doing things not necessarily to raise the buildings, but what you would call resiliency. So there's a lot of stuff in what we call resilient space where they're trying to, to do things like create dams and pumping systems to make the city like Miami, to make the city itself more resilient and resistant to climate change. I mean, I'm from new Orleans. So if y'all have a solution to prevent cities from sinking and flooding, I would love to hear it. Uh, but there's a, there's, so that's a lot of infrastructure and there are a couple different things. Like I said, most of it is, is trying to build seawalls to keep the water out, but that's only going to be, that's a temporary solution. Um, you can't, and, and relocating a city is also not a feasible solution. So it's how do we try to mitigate climate change? How do we try to lessen the, the impact that we're having on the environment so that rising seawater is not something we have to deal with, at least for this by mid-century, you know? Um, but yeah, it's 
They're, I think, oh yes, I think it's like the Netherlands that has that complex uh, seawall system. That's really interesting. Thank you for that answer. I've been curious about this for a while, based off of some of my previous classes. No, it's Appreciate cool. It. And I mean, you're honestly, you guys are the people who will probably solve this problem because, you know, the people right now are looking at it with old eyes. <laughs> you know, you're looking, we're looking at the solutions that exist and trying to apply it. We need people to come in and think about things that no one would have ever thought about. So you might be the person that comes up with the solution to stay you know, the Gulf Coast. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's it for now. So I wouldn't guess yeah. I can ask my question. Let's go. All right. Uh, my question is like, what's like, what's your motivation of like trying to build like a better future for everyone? So I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the, the lack of equity that you see for women and underrepresented groups in so many different industries. Um, I always am someone that because I had to struggle, I don't want anybody else to have to struggle. Like, I'm not a fan of like, oh, you have to work hard and pay your dues. Like, no, like you should have to work hard, but you shouldn't have to work hard and struggle because of things that are outside of your control. Um, and so that's really always been my thing. Like my parents raised me that you always reach back and you always give back. That's hence why I'm here. Because if the information I'm giving you guys can help spark creativity or an idea within you, that's that's me doing my job. I'm sure your teachers who why they teach. They did not go into teaching for the money. My mom's an educator. I know that's not why they did it. <laughs> They're doing it to build a better future for everybody involved. And so, <laughs> and so that's, you really, you really have to think about it like that way that like, I struggle. I don't want you to have to struggle. So how can I make the world a little bit easier for you? How can I leave the world a little bit better than when it was when I got here? Thank you. That was really mm -hmm. motivational. <laughs> I think that's it for the question. So you can okay. have another question. Mm -hmm. Um, who was who was the per who, who would you say is the person that um motivates you the most? Like, um, so I'm gonna give you a cliche millennial answer. Then I'm gonna give you like the truth. So Beyonce. Um, when I'm having a bad day, it's Beyonce. Um. But then it's also my mom. Um, my mom has two master's degrees that she earned over 35. She did a complete career change in her late 30s. So she started out as a nurse um, and decided she wanted to go into education and went, got certified, got her master's, started to her PhD. Um, she works in administration now at a school in Atlanta. Um, she's been working probably for like, she probably should be retired to be honest she's been working in the school system so long um but like she's my motivation because she showed me that like there's always the room for you to say to change you can always change you can always choose again you can always find pave a new path it doesn't matter how old you are that's something i hear a lot from the people in my life who are in their early 20s that they're so freaked out that they're not going to be rich by 30 most of us are not rich at 30. Um, and so don't stress about that. But like, you can choose again. You can get out there, get into a career and be like, this is not what I want to do. As long as you're breathing, you achieve it. So you can choose again. Like, And that was the big lesson that she taught me. And that's probably how I went from I want to be a buyer to now my goal, my dream career title as a credited investor. Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess that's it for the questions. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, we really like appreciate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's another question. Okay. Um, by Rike. Do you see yourself changing your career again? Probably. Probably. I mean, I, I still got plenty of time before I can retire, so probably. Yeah. Um, I tell people all the time I would love to be a history teacher, so that may be my retirement plan. You know, I got time though. I don't know that the schools are ready for me, so. <laughs> I'm guessing that's it for the questions. Uh, feel okay. free to move on. Yeah. Back no. to your presentation. So, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, I think the most important thing 
in that presentation. Let me pull up. Because the most important, the thing that y'all want to know about, honestly, are the companies. I'm going to pull up. Uh, all right. All right. So this is what you guys want to know. What are the companies doing cool stuff? What are the kind of companies that you guys are investing in? Um, so this is for green building. Like I said, when we talk about energy, we're not talking about, you know, new solar companies or, companies that are looking at like hydrogen and things like that. Most of the companies for us that are in energy are companies who are, um, they're developing solutions for building owners and man managers to kind of become more efficient. Uh, so I'm trying to pull out a couple ones that I think are cool. So Block Power, they're based in New York. Um, they're doing new HVAC systems. So HVAC, so your heating, air conditioning, that is one of the biggest contributors to, again, operational carbon. So in the built environment, you've got two types of carbon. One is operational, which is the carbon from running the building. So the lights, the AC, you know, the heating, all of that. Then you have what we call embodied carbon. That's the carbon from the building materials themselves. So cement has its own carbon footprint. Um, if you're manufacturing steel beams, that has its own carbon footprint. So those materials and some of the process of how those materials are made, that's another set of carbon. So energy efficiency for us, operational carbon. Um, trying to think who we got this. So we got Block Power that's cool. And Noviews is another company that we're looking at investing in. Um, they do window systems. Very, it's... It's something I never thought about because I never thought about window. Who thinks about the window? You just open it. You know, they develop these new window systems that can actually save older buildings money because older buildings have old window systems that let in the hot air when it's hot outside, let in the cool air when it's cold outside, and you're losing a ton of energy. And so these new systems actually allow it for relatively cheap, you're relatively inexpensively you can update your window systems. Um, I think a couple other ones that I think might be cool. So we have in here um, hemp, hempcrete. So, car, so concrete or cement made from hemp products. Very cool. There's a ton of stuff going on with, uh, with cement and alternatives in that space and mixing in different types of aggregates. Another company in that uh, area under new materials, Alchemy, and uh, ArcLight, both of those companies use hard to recycle uh, plastics and they kind of turn them into gravel that can be mixed into the cement that makes the cement lighter. And it's also taking something that cannot be recycled and recycling it so that you're getting the benefit of being able to recycle something that would be sitting in a landfill and you're making that cement lighter, you're making that cement a little bit more carbon friendly. Um, and then, like I said, we got some water, indoor air qualities because of COVID. Everybody's talking about how to make the indoor air better. So a couple of companies, they're just using sensors to kind of understand what's floating around in the air um, so that they, you can actually do the assessment and, and talk about ways in which you can clean. Some of them are actually going to help filter the air. Some of them are actually just tracking it to understand what you need to be doing to make your air to improve your air quality. Um, and so, yeah, so that's when you talk about green building tech, that's the kind of thing. So like we have design software that makes it easier for them to design more eco-friendly projects. Carbon management is really understanding the carbon footprint of a project. Um, and then also understanding, you know, what you need to be doing to make it, uh, to reduce your carbon footprint. Yes, yeah, like kind of high level. And so that to me, like that's the most important thing. Most of these companies, a couple of them are companies that we have invested in. Um, a couple of them are public, are, are going to be going public soon. Um, if you're really interested in energy and companies to watch in energy, it's 
check out Breakthrough Energy Ventures. That's Bill Gates. Like they they invest in a ton of energy companies, and you'll be able to see some of the startups that they're investing in. Um, a couple of them are on here. One shift under energy efficiency, and then carbon cure under new materials. Both of them are uh, part of Breakthrough. I think no. That shit for sure. Carbon, carbon cure, and um, sea power is the other one that are part of Breakthrough's portfolio. But yeah, if you're looking to get in on like what's the new hot energy stuff, follow them, check them out what they're doing. So yeah, that's that's really like I said. That's I think those are that's the most important thing that you guys really kind of want to understand on that in that deck. It's a lot of tons of information around what some of the challenges and the opportunities are. But I think the takeaway, even the investors who come and download that report from us, they just screenshot that slide and put it in their slide deck that they present to their companies. So, yeah. Any questions about some of those companies that I kind of talked about or some of the challenges you guys want to talk more about in the space? Thinking on another question. Okay. Hi. So, Anastasia, I, I have a question, by the way. Um, okay. In regards to the, the, the companies that you have mentioned, right, are all of them focused mm-hmm. on, like, passive house design? Um, so, no. Okay. So, no, none, none that we kind of are looking at right now. No. Yeah, most of the companies that we work with, um, they're going to be commercial real estate. Uh, We have one company that we've invested in, Icon 3D, that's in residential. Um, Icon is actually a very cool company, if you have time to check it out. So they do 3D printed houses. So they use a gantry robot and cement, like, and they 3D print a house. They can 3D print a house in about 24 hours. And it's just like, and it's very cool. It's perfect for the affordable housing crisis um, globally that people are seeing. We're seeing a lot of it going into um, Latin America. They actually have a project they're doing in Latin America right now. They're trying to sell into the U.S. Most of it is in the Southwest because that's where they're based in Austin. But yeah, that's one of our portfolio companies. Incredibly cool. So it's just Icon 3D. Awesome. Icon 3D. Yep. Yeah. It's like I said, it's super I, cool. I wonder, it would be an interesting uh, thing to research and see if there's a, actually a company in the city that perhaps we can have students visit and, you know, have them mm-hmm. take a look at how these sort of robotics and, you know, advanced 3D printing machines work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually I spoke with someone recently who has a similar project. Let me do some digging on that for you guys. Because um, it's somebody I know who has a similar project that um, could be interesting. And I'll say, I can send over to the video for Icon. Because the video is mad cool. Oh, hi, I have a question. Go so, ahead. I'm also a part of another program is called my sister's keeper and so it's a group of ladies and all and like we've been trying to learn more about like financials and try to incorporate that into our program so Mm -hmm. i was wondering if maybe one of these days we have meetings on thursdays or but whenever you're available if you'd be able to speak to us one day because being that you're marketing and all like you would be a really good person to talk to us yeah i got you um just We'll we'll make sure that we can get connected. All right, through Mr. Cody. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions, guys? I know Dimitri, you were trying to rack your brain for one for a second. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have any, it's totally fine. You know. I'm sure you guys are going to have questions later on and just send them to
to your teachers, they'll send them to me. I can, I, I have no problem, like, answering questions. You guys, like, seriously talking to you guys keeps me up on stuff. So I wanted, I need y'all to tell me, like, what, what are some of the things you're excited about, you know? What are some of the things you guys are, are looking forward to when it comes to technology or in climate tech? Like, what are y'all, what, 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 what's on your radar is what I want to know, you know? Oh, um, what I was thinking of as far as like technology, mm-hmm. uh, yesterday I recently like my brother had lost my um my fire my um fire stick remote. I couldn't find it for like a day. Um, so I was thinking of like touchscreen TVs, like that's what I was thinking of as far as technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that exists. Oh. I'm pretty sure they exist. Um, I don't have one, but I'm fairly certain they exist. So I don't think it solves the losing the remote problem. Um, So think about like what would make it easier for you to find your remote. That's where I would start. Like, you know, there are tiles that you can put on stuff so that you can like essentially find my phone for whatever it is that you attach the tile to. But what if you just had like, hey, Alexa, where's my remote? That would be a good idea. You know, but you have to figure out how to un- how to get Alexa to understand like the location of the remote and to respond and tell you where the remote is. Mm-hmm. That's a whole different conversation, but I'm sure you guys will figure that out. Anything else, guys? Any final thoughts, burning desires you guys want to get out? All right. So, how do you all want to? How do you conclude? So, Demetri, you're my MC. You got to tell me. Hey, I don't think there are any more questions. So, okay. um, <laughs> we really appreciate you um, coming on here and just sharing information, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, Sharing us also like the um, different companies you work with. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Okay, thank you for coming on here today. Yeah, no problem. I saw somebody raise a hand. I got a hand that just got raised. Is what I saw. Is that? Am I making that up? Is that, I saw it. Um, hello, Go. I'm sorry. I have one last question. Go ahead. Um, you said don't ever take advice from investing online. Yeah. Why is that? Because you don't know that person's credentials. Everybody, yeah. So I'm gonna and like I, I, I tell this to adults all the time. Um, there are a lot of people on TikTok and Instagram and Clubhouse and whatever social media apps you're on who will give you advice, and you gotta always take it with like a grain of sand because you need to understand: is this person qualified to give me advice? That's really what you need to know. Like. Can this person actually give me advice? But then for financial advice, I can't give you financial advice unless I know your financial situation. So I don't know how much money you have. I don't know, like, what is a lot to me, what's a lot to you might be very different. Um, And so you want to make sure that whenever someone's giving you financial advice on the Internet, that you're taking into account your unique situation. And then also taking into account, you know, the information that you've been able to research and verify yourself. Yeah, uh, I Lane's was is raising his hand right now. Okay, that's it. Yes, I. What kind of what tips or tricks would you recommend who might be interested in entering the field of work? Okay, so you kind of cut out a little bit. So you said, what tips or tricks would I have for students who want to learn, who want to go into venture capital? Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, honestly, it's like I said before, pay attention to your math classes. Um, it's a lot of math. It's understanding gross margins. It's understanding market sizes. Um, it's not like 
differential equation type map, very basic addition, multiplication, subtraction, but make sure that you're good at it. You can do it forwards and backwards and you understand what those numbers mean um, and what they mean for the health of a company. Also, I would say like right now we're talking about the stock market because everybody's talking about the stock market. So start looking at some of those companies. So, you know, everybody's talking about GameStop. Go and understand like why that, how that played out, why it played out the way that it did. But then also research those companies, you know, because that's like a big chunk of what I do is sitting down with companies and understanding their potential path for success. So that's, that's the kind of thing you want to do. And then also, like I said, pursue what it is you're passionate about. You know, there's venture capital firms for everything. I spoke with someone who has a VC firm for esports. You know, there's stuff you like gaming. You understand that market. They got venture capitalists who invest in that, you know. And so that's, that's really what I would say. But yeah, it's really, it's math heavy. It's finance. Finance is great on that. You got to love it. I do not love math. It's like expressing it. <laughs> um, but I can do it. And that's another thing too. Sometimes you do what you don't love so that you can do the other things that you do. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you again. No, no problem. Thank you guys for showing up. Thank y'all. I believe the children are our future. Uh, teach them well and let them lead the way. <laughs> they don't know what I'm talking about. That was for the teachers. <laughs> y'all, thank you so much for being such a great audience. And you guys have a great evening. You too. Thank you so much for everything. And once again, I'm so happy that you were here, part of this. It was amazing for the students.